السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا My dear viewers, welcome to another live edition of Gardens of the Pious and today's episode is number 568 We'll continue with chapter number 249 and basically we only have one hadith left. Uh, we could have covered it by the end of the previous episode, but it doesn't really matter how much we cover. What matters is that Alhamdulillah, Shukullah, we're learning something new and we're benefiting, so we're not actually on a hurry. And that's why I didn't mind postponing this short hadith to the beginning of a new episode, today's episode. Hadith number 1464 is in chapter number 249 which is a chapter of the book of the remembrance of Allah the 15th chapter of the gardens of the pious the supplication was to be recited before sleeping and Hudayfat radiyallahu anhu anna rasulallah sallallahu alayhi wa sallama kana idha arada an yarquda وضع يده اليمنى تحت خده ثم يقول اللهم قني عذابك يوم تبعث عبادك حفصة may Allah be pleased with her also narrated that he used to say this three times so حذيفة رضي الله عنه narrated that the messenger of Allah peace be upon him whenever he intended to go to sleep he would place his right hand under his right cheek and supplicate, O oh Allah, qini adabaka yawma tab'athu ibadak. Protect me against your punishment on the day when you resurrect your servants. In another narration by Hafsa, the mother of the believers, radiyallahu anha, the daughter of Umar al-Khattab, she quoted the same narration, except that she added also that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi used to recite it three times. What is it? Allahumma qini adabaka yawma tab'athu ibadak. And let me show you how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to do it. This is the right palm. He will place it beneath the right cheek, which means he will be lying down on his right side. And he will say, Bismik Allahumma amutu wa ahya. Bismik Allahumma daqtu jambi wa bika arfa'u. Allahumma in amsakta nafsi fahwadha. وَإِنْ أَرْسَلْتَهَا فَاحْفَظْهَا بِمَا تَحْفَظُ بِهِ عِبَادَكَ الصَّالِحِينَ اللهم أسلمت نفسي إليك ووجهت وجهي إليك وثوضت أمري إليك وألجأت ظهري إليك رغبة ورهبة إليك لا ملجأ ولا منجا منك إلا إليك اللهم قيني عذابك يوم تبعث عبادك three times So the previous invocations before going to sleep we have learned them over the past couple episodes and today's supplication Allahumma qini adabaka yawma tab'athu ibadak O Allah, guard me against your torment on the day when you resurrect your servants You know brothers and sisters indeed the adhkar are the greatest means of protection protection against the harms which may take place in the dunya and the harms which may take place when the person is asleep and the harms which may take place in the grave or in the hereafter seeking refuge and protection in Allah the Almighty and seeking His guarding against all kind of harms will definitely benefit the servant of Allah so when you say when you're alive and you're going to sleep and you never know whether you will make it back to life or not O oh Allah guard me against your torment on the day when you will resurrect your servants insha'Allah you will be guarded and you will be protected and now without any further ado a brand new book 
the book of Adawat. A book of Adawat. The previous book was the book of Al Azkar. The fifteenth book was the book of the remembrance of Allah, where we learned mutlaq al zikr to recite it whenever, as many times as you want, and a specific kind of zikr, the specific zikr at certain times, certain places, in certain number of times. <coughs> and mainly praises of the Almighty Allah and including some invocations. And now the following book is the right order because he will be talking about the verses of Ad-Dua. What is Ad-Dua? Ad-Dua is to invoke Allah the Almighty, is to ask. Ad-Dua means calling, calling upon. And here, since it is the greatest act of worship, it is calling upon the Almighty Allah. In Surah Al-A'raf, the Almighty Allah says, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَادْعُوهُ بِهَا وَذَرُوا الَّذِينَ يُلْحِدُونَ فِي أَسْمَائِهِ To Allah belongs the beautiful names. فَادْعُوهُ بِهَا It is the word ad-du'a, ad-du'uhu, call upon him via his beautiful names. Call upon Allah using His most beautiful names, which He either taught us in the Quran or in any revelation to His Prophet Muhammad or to the prophets before him, or a name that He kept in the knowledge of the unseen with Him, which we have no uh, idea about. So we call upon Allah with the names which we already know, whether it has been confirmed in the Quran or in the sound sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa That is dua. We begin with the verses of making dua, and how to make dua, and how to invoke Allah the Almighty, and ask from Him. Babu, the first chapter in the 16th book, Babu al-Da'wat, the chapter which deals with al-amru bid-du'a'i wa fadlihi, وبيان وفضله وبيان جمل من أدعيته. So this chapter is about the virtue of making du'a and mentioning some of the invocations of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. The comprehensive du'a. The first ayah obviously is ayah number sixty of Surah Ghafir, in which Allah the Almighty says. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ ادْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ And the meaning of this ayah, that the Almighty Allah, your Lord, has commanded, ادْعُونِي invoke me. Ask of me, ask from me. أستجب دعاءكم And if you do, I will respond to your invocation. I shall answer your dua. Verily, those who يستكبرون عن عبادتي They scorn my worship by not invoking me, by not calling upon me, by not asking from me. They will surely enter hellfire in humiliation. So according to this ayah, that Allah the Almighty loves His servants to invoke Him and to call upon Him. This is fact number one. Fact number two, those who turn away from Allah and they do not invoke Him, they do not ask from Him, it seems like they are self-sufficient. They are not in need for His help. And this is a sign of disbelief. And this is a sign of lack of appreciation and gratitude. And that's why he said that those who scorn my worship shall enter hellfire in humiliation. So in one flip we have the command of ud'uni, make dua, ask of me. And on the other flip, and if you don't, then you will be thrown in hellfire with humiliation. Like the other ayah, وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكُمْ لَإِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ وَلَإِنْ كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ 
So a shukr which is showing gratitude to Allah, giving thanks to Him and saying Alhamdulillah will incur getting more of the blessings. Allah will be pleased with you and He will give you more. What if a person is not grateful? What if a person is not showing gratitude? Then that is equivalent to kuf. وَلَئِنْ كَفَرْتُمْ So شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ كَفَرْتُمْ دِنْ عَذَابِ شديد. Indeed my torment is very painful, is very severe, is very powerful. So what is the opposite of shukr? <coughs> kuf. And what is the opposite of making dua? Kuf. Being scorning Allah's worship is an act of disbelief. So if you make dua, guaranteed that your dua will be answered. When Allah says, astajib lakum, I like to encircle the word and examine it, scrutinize it. We need to look at the word astajib lakum. Because soon after I finish this segment, we're going to get some calls where people say, I have been making dua. I didn't get what I wanted. I always dreamt of buying PlayStation 4 or 5. I always dreamt of buying the S500. And I've been asking Allah to marry this girl and it never happened. Well, the Quran teaches us that out of the divine wisdom of the Almighty Allah, that He corrects our wrong invocation. Allah said, وَيَدْعُ الْإِنسَانُ بِالشَّرِّ دعاءه بالخير وكان الإنسان عجولا يدعو الإنسان بالشر دعاءه بالخير means a person the human being may keep begging and asking for something he is assuming that this is the best for him his life is contingent on that if I get this I will be the happiest person on earth while it is definitely terrible thing for him he doesn't know وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ عَجُولًا Man is very hasty. Insan, humankind are very hasty. If they were to know what is written for them in the unseen and Allah's choice for them, they would have accepted with pleasure. And that's why the condition of the believers, they do so without knowing, without looking at the, uh, at the unseen, without knowing what is written for them. They trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our most beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in this respect, when Allah said, Astajib, that's a promise. Umar ibn Khattab said, I'm not really worried about answering the dua. I do not worry about that because it is guaranteed that my dua will be answered. He said it, Astajib laku. What I'm worried about is making dua, is supplicating, is invoking Allah the Almighty. Yani worry about your turn, worry about your role and job, which is making supplication. So the first part of the equation, when you make dua, you raise your hands, you make dua, fulfilling the conditions of dua, then guaranteed your dua is accepted. Number one is heard, number two accepted, number three will be answered. But how? <coughs> How? This is up to Allah and His wisdom. Either by delivering immediately the kind of help that you need. Or by giving you something better. Allah knows better, so He may give you better. Or if your dua is not answered immediately in either way, then the Almighty Allah will spare your dua to benefit you as means of intercession for you on the day of resurrection. And guess what? That is the best case scenario. I mean, if I, if I need something urgently right now, and I invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get it, and instead I don't get it, rather Allah keeps this dua as a credit for me, so on the day of judgment, when people will be desperately in need for any help, the dua will pop up to help me. Which one is better? Definitely the one in the hereafter. Again, we're addressing those who believe in Allah, and in the last day, believe in all His messengers, Believe in his angels, believe in the unseen, believe in the divine ordainment. They believe that when they say, Sami Allahu liman hamida, upon rising up from Rukur, they really mean it. And Allah the Almighty definitely hear their dua and their praises. The second reference 
is of Surat Al-A'raf, ayah number 55, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ud'u rabbakum tadarru'an wa khufyatan innahu la yuhibbu al-mu'tadeen. So in this ayah there is a direct command that whenever you make dua you should fulfill two conditions. And the, the conditions are also considered the adab, the etiquette, the etiquette of making khushua, of making supplication. The first is to invoke Allah out of humility and humbleness. And the second is to invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in private. What does it mean? It means when you make dua, you're not supposed to scream out loud. فَإِنَّكُمْ إِرْبَعُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِكُمْ فَإِنَّكُمْ لَا تَدْعُونَ أَصَمًّا وَلَا غَائِبًا وَإِنَّمَا تَدْعُونَ سَمِيعًا بَصِيرًا Once the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, while traveling with his companions, and they were raising their voices with the dhikr, screaming with their dua. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِرْبَعُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِكُمْ Take it easy. Take it easy. Why do you scream? Why do you raise your voices out loud? <coughs> do you think that he cannot hear you? He does. إِنَّكُمْ لَا تَدْعُونَ أَصَمًّا وَلَا غَائِبًا You're not invoking one who is deaf or absent. You are invoking one who's all hearer and he's present. He's all seer. He knows your need even without asking, without calling upon him. But he permitted you and he commanded you to ask from him. So when you ask, you should fulfill these two conditions. at tadarra which is out of humility. When you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should show that you are desperately in need. And no one other than him can help you. This is a sign of khushua. This is a sign of humbleness. And that makes your dua more worthy of being accepted. On the day of Arafah, when people <coughs> have been traveling in the past, they used to travel on foot, on the back of their camels. So that creates clouds of dust. So they will be dusty, they will be disheveled hair uh, and uh, covered with dust. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept their dua in their condition. He says to his angels, انظروا إلى عبادي أتوني شعثا غبرا شعثا their hair is disheveled they don't have time to comb their hair and they're busy with the ibadah during these circumstances غبرا they have been traveling they are dusty covered with dust and this condition of humility makes one's dua most likely and more worthy to be accepted it's like exactly when you وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى When your employees walks into your office and he kicks the door with his foot and he throws a paper and says, I need a vacation. Oh, really? Okay. Rejected. Refused. You are impolite. Or, hey, man, I need a raise. We don't do that with our boss. We don't do that with our teachers or the principal of the school. We don't do that when anyone who is superior to us, especially when we need a thing from them. We are super nice to them and we thank them. We appreciate what they're doing, even if you cannot swallow them. Why? Because you need something from them. Or in the case of Allah, لِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى I am from head to toe belong to Him. I and whatever I possess belong to Him. My sight, He gave it to me. My hearing, he gave it to me and he's maintaining that. The taste, the digestion, the breathing, the heart, I mean, life at large and the sustaining of my life is all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, he says, you want more? Just ask me. Call upon me. So, ud'u rabbakum tadarru'an wa khufyah. Tadarru'an out of humility. وَخُفْيَةً 
and in private. Do not scream out loud while making uh, dua. إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ By transgressing in the dua. Transgressing in the dua is by violating these two conditions or adab. يعني <coughs> by asking Allah while you are absent-minded. Yes, a lot of people do that. So he is watching television and he's making dua. His, his mind is hearing, is totally attentive to the game. Okay? And he's making dua. That is not proper. And that does not fulfill the condition and the etiquette of at-tadarra. Okay? Screaming with the dua. That is not proper. Rather, the person should make dua out of humility and in secret. Or if he raises his voice with it, it shouldn't be out loud. Other than that, this is some sort of transgression in the dua. And there are other means of transgression in the dua when the person becomes very, like, very specific in the details, like, oh Allah, I need a red Mercedes with two seats and leather seats and sunroof and all of that. Ask Allah for something which is good. Give a comprehensive call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say in his dua, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannata wa ma qarraba ilayha min qawlin aw amal. Wa a'udhu bika min al-nari wa ma qarraba ilayha min qawlin aw amal. What does it mean? Oh Allah, I ask you to enter al-jannah. And I ask you for everything that brings me close to al-jannah, whether a saying or an action. And I seek refuge with you against hellfire. And I seek refuge with you against anything that brings me close to hellfire of action or saying. So when somebody says, Oh Allah, I ask you for 300 of al hurulain and I ask you for a white palace, which has a water spring, and I ask you for, this is silly. You know, you enter al-Jannah, you get what you want. But this is like uh, transgressing in the supplication. إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ Rather, عَلَيْكَ بِجَوَامِعِ الْكَلِمِ Invoke Allah the Almighty with something which is comprehensive and do not transgress. It's time to take a short break and soon after the break, inshallah, we have some beautiful verses to discuss as well. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Please stay tuned. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Uh, let me remind you with our contact informations, the phone numbers 002 then 023 and uh, another phone number area code 002 then 0100546 and the WhatsApp numbers are code 001-347-806-0025. And finally, are code 001-361-489-1503. Uh, we're live both on my Facebook page, M. Salah Official, and the YouTube channel. The following reference is the most powerful reference, irrespective of dua and the power of making dua and the great virtue of making dua. It is of the second chapter of the Quran, ayah number 186. Uh, it is quite interesting that the ayat from 183 and the following ayat are talking about fasting and the shahr of Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, and the details of when to fast, when to break your fast, and so on. Then in the middle, we find ayah number 186. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ So the ayah says, O oh Muhammad, because whenever there is a pronoun ka, Allah is addressing the second person, Prophet Muhammad in this case. 
He says, whenever my servants ask you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, concerning me, they ask you about me, then answer them, I am indeed near. How near? Near to them than the, their own selves, than their own jugular veins, near by my knowledge, by my rifa, by ilm. I accept and I respond to the invocation of the caller whenever he calls upon me. Without any intermediary, without any one in between or in the middle. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ So let them respond to me, let them obey me, and let them believe in me in order to be rightly guided. This ayah is a very unique ayah, brothers and sisters. There have been many times in the Qur'an, whether in Surah Al-Baqarah or uh, in other surah, the word yas'alunaka, they ask you about. There is yas'alunaka anil khamri wal maysir. And there is wa yas'alunaka anil mahid. And there is yas'aluka an nasu anil sa'a. And there is the beginning of al anfal. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْأَنْفَالِ We can quote many places in the Qur'an where the ayah begins with They ask you, O Muhammad. Somebody is asking you, O Muhammad. If people were to ask you, O Muhammad, then after the question is presented, Allah the Almighty begins answering the question by saying قُلْ يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْأَنْفَالِ قُلِ الْأَنْفَالُ لِلَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ قُلْ قُلْ So the command verb قُلْ begins the answer. قُلْ Say, tell them. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ They ask you concerning uh, drinking and gambling. What do you think of that? That was the very first stage uh, of uh, tackling the prohibition of Drinking and gambling. قُلْ فِيهِمَا إِثْمٌ كَبِيرٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْمَحِيضِ قُلْ هُوَ أَذَنْ فَاعْتَزِلُ النِّسَاءَ فِي الْمَحِيضِ وَلَا تَقْرَبُوهُنَّ حَتَّى يَطُهُرُ Also of Surah Al-Baqarah. يَسْأَلُونَكَ They ask you about the menses which women experience on monthly basis. قُلْ so the answer begins with, tell them, say, O Muhammad. And this ayah 186 of Surah Al-Baqarah also is a mas'ala. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي oh, In case that my servant ask you about me, there is no qul. There is the only su'al or question in the entire Qur'an which the answer is delivered but without the command verb قُلْ which means say. Why? Listen to the answer and you will figure it out, you will figure it out on your own. The answer is إِنِّي قريب. I am very near. Uh, in another ayah Allah says وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ And indeed we are nearer to him than his own juggler vein. وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَحُولُ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَقَلْبِهِ Allah is in between the person and his heart. I mean, he's closer to you than your own heart, than your own nafs. يَعْلَمُ السِّرَّ وَأَخْفَى He knows what is hidden, what you conceal in your own heart, in your own self, and you don't share with anyone. This is how near Allah is, is to any of us. So in this case, Allah the Almighty said, no need to say قُلْ And this is very eloquent. So it's an indication of He is very near to the extent that no point of saying قُلْ لَهُمْ or tell them or answer them. The answer is delivered immediately. Allah is answering us without any intermediary. Oh, who you believe, 
indeed I am near. Then in the other ayat explain how near, his nearness. And what is the benefit of being near by his knowledge, by his hearing, by his sight? Uh, so if somebody invokes me, I shall answer their dua. So in this case, let them respond to me by obeying me, by making dua, by believing in me in order to be rightly guided. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Tawbah from India, assalamu alaikum. Sister Tawbah, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the program, um, sister. Sheikh. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Uh, today I had uh, three questions, but um, I would appreciate it if you answer the first one uh, first before I ask the rest of the ten, the rest of them because um, they are related to um, each other. Okay. So the first uh, first one was that um, I had uh, um, I was looking for a list of major sins in Islam because um, I wanted to avoid them, inshallah. So I came across um, a book called Al Kabai by Imam Al Dhahabi that lists that there are only 70 major sins in Islam. So is that authentic? It is authentic. Okay. Then uh, my second question was that in that book, um, uh, one of the major sins that is given is um, abandoning your relatives, right? So um, I am in a situation where I, uh, uh, my father has had a fight with one of his brothers and now they are not talking. Now, in my situation, I did not used to talk to my uncle before the fight, nor am I doing right now. On the phone, I mean, because it's not in our uh, culture to call up our uncles if of this in this type. So, am I also um, considered as a, um, breaking kinship because I wasn't really used to talking to him before, nor am I right now. So, I don't know if I'm committing a sin or not. Um, uh, my last question was that um, uh, uh, if a person um, commits a sin that comes under hukuk al ibad um, for example, backbiting or listening to backbiting or slandering of this sort, um, um, by mistake. So basically, subconsciously, he slipped and he said something, no. or uh, he slipped and he heard something, and uh, he felt regretted it, and he asked for forgiveness for that, and he uh, really, really promised to not go back to it but he went back to it and again and again and again and so on but each time he's sincere in his repentance is his repentance accepted or not okay got your questions Tauba from india assalamu alaikum sister aisha from singapore assalamu alaikum <coughs> sister aisha Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Sister Aisha. Welcome to the program. Go ahead. What is your question? Okay, Sheikh. I have this question. Uh, in my country, uh, when a woman uh, uh, prays for salat, we will wear a full talakum. We call it talakum. But I ever heard of a ustad, uh, of a ustad saying that for a woman who prays when she stood when she sujud. Uh, her palms have to touch the uh, have to touch the uh, sajada. Is it true? For a man or a woman, sister Aisha. Uh, for a woman. No, for a man or a woman, their prayer is alike. And okay. in the in the sujood, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "I was commanded to touch the floor with seven body parts. Okay, the two palms. This is for both men and women." So those who, uh, you know, rest on their uh, fists, their sujood is not valid. And that invalidates the whole prayer. If the two palms must be, not necessarily the sajada or the prayer rug or jar namaz, on the floor, okay? So on the floor and the forehead and the nose and the two knees and the toes of the two feet. By doing so, your sujood is valid. No difference between a man and a woman in this respect. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith, Sallu kama ra'aytu muni usalli, pray as you have seen me praying. And he addressed both men and women with this command. He did not make any distinction, nor did he say that a woman's prayer should be different than 
a man's prayer. Thank you, Aisha. Assalamu alaikum. Muhammad from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Oh, that's my friend Sheikh Muhammad. How are you? Fine. Okay. What is your question today, Muhammad? My question today is um, the Quran. Go ahead. What is it? Yeah. Uh, what is the meaning of Mu'atirina Muqni'i Ru'usihim La Yartaddu Ilayhim Parfum Wa Afidatukum Hawa Wa Anzirin Nas Nas I got it. Wa Anzirin Nas I got your question, yes. Muhammad. Okay. Muqni'i Ru'usihim They will be raising their heads like that. Staring at something. They cannot even blink out of fear and that will happen to the criminals on the day of judgment may Allah protect us again is that thank you Muhammad from Nigeria mashallah his tilawat is beautiful uh, sister Tawba from India uh, Hanif from Bangladesh assalamu alaikum Hanif Assalamu alaikum. How are you doing, my beloved Sheikh? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hanif, welcome to the program, Akhi. Yesterday you asked me a question which I could not hear, uh, which is why I could not answer you either. I am the same Hanif who called Sheikh is with stairs. This is what and I figured. My today's question is, uh, and my today's question is, can, a, can someone take a bath, undress within a closed room. Within, May Allah grant you can, can, can somebody take a bath and dress within what room? Can some, somebody take a bath undressed, undressed oh, within yes, a yes, closed yes. room? Yes, Akhi, it is permissible to undress to take a bath. And Aisha radiallahu anha narrated that she and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to bath naked in the same vessel. So it's permissible. Yes, how can somebody take a bath while dressed up? So it's okay to take off your clothes in order to take a bath. Thank you, Akhi uh, Hanif. Barakallah fikum. I know this is kind of cultural. Assalamu alaikum. Idris from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum, ya Idris. Uh, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, respected Sheikh. Ahlan wa sahlan. Welcome to the program. Go ahead, Akhi. Uh, how are you, respected Sheikh? I'm doing great, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. And you? Uh, I'm, I'm doing uh, good, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. Uh, I, today I just all, uh, had only one question, yeah. uh, which I just uh, came about, uh, respected Sheikh. Uh, a, f a cousin of mine uh, just had a beautiful uh, girl uh, last week uh, so uh, he asked me to uh, do the azan for her and uh, as in our culture they they do it usually when the baby is born so what is the authentic way of uh, islam to go about uh, the newborns uh, as i know the uh, by uh, when a uh, male is born i know the uh, uh, the terms to do that but not about the girl so well, you, uh, same for a girl uh, Idris same for a girl but please those who call the adhan in the ear of the newborn make it very light okay do not make it loud because they are still very vulnerable yes it is recommended to do so Hanif uh, Idris sister Tawba from India because we ran out of time upholding the ties of kinship is as compulsory as offering the prayer. Qala ta'ala in Surah An-Nisa wa'abudu allaha wa la tushriku bihi shay'an wa bil walidayni ihsanan wa bidil qurba. So worship Allah, take care of your parents and their relatives. Uphold the ties of the kinship. Okay? And it's a big sin. It is not just a regular major or gonah kabir or major sin to sever the relationship with one's relatives and not to uphold the ties. But also the Prophet ﷺ said there is no other thing which incurs an immediate wrath and punishment more than severing the relationship with one's relatives. So the uncles, 
Yes, it is incumbent on you to uphold their ties. Uh, if you cannot visit them by calling them, by checking on them, because they are like your parents. And you try to reconcile between your dad and your uncle. So even though before, uh, like she said that in our culture, it's not really something that the, we call our uncles. But in Islam it is. We visit them. We initiate a visit. Especially where are you going? I'm going to visit my uncle. Even in another town. Because he has rights upon me. What if they are not fulfilling their duties towards you? Even though I am doing what am I supposed to do? So your duty is to fulfill what the command of Allah says. He says, qurba." So you should stick to that and uphold the ties of kinship. Okay? Uh, with regards to حقوق العباد, what you mentioned. Um, whenever it is a sin pertaining to one of the acts which Allah has commanded to guard and you didn't do, or to stay away from and you violated. In this case, Tawbah, by asking Allah to forgive you and by making up the, uh, if it is a missed prayer or fasting, inshallah will do it. But if the sin is pertaining the right of another human being, then besides what we mentioned earlier, in addition to that, you have to ask the person to pardon you. If the sin is something material, you've taken their money, their property, it won't be simply easy to say, oh Allah, forgive me, and that's it. You've got to give them what you've taken away from them in order to be forgiven and they pardon you. If it was a false testimony, it led to a damage. You're liable in order to be forgiven. We said in the case of backbiting or slandering, the person should assess the situation and see if he or she is going to tell the person, well, I did talk ill about you. If that's going to hurt their feeling and make it worse, then do not share this with them. Rather, seek forgiveness from Allah. Pray for them in your pocket and defend them in times whenever it is needed, defend their honor. So hopefully that insha'Allah will take care of it. Brothers and sisters, by that we've come to the end of today's edition of Gardens of the Pious. Until next episode, I leave you all in the care of Allah. Qulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. To be the best and give his best religion to them. Allah, our God, is the greatest, the one and only glory to him. He born in humans to be the best and give his best religion to them. So, why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about him in paradise, worshipping cows, fire, and stones. Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling their best with the cheapest price so